Michael, what's up, brother? Great to have you back on the podcast. Looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, likewise, man. It's good to be back. I appreciate you having me. So I just want to address the probably one of the number one questions that I receive, and we're going to work our way backwards into your book and message, but I think this is very poignant based on what you're talking about. One of the questions I get all the time is, how do you balance contentment and ambition? That's something that I hear from the guys all the time about, hey, I want to be happy and satisfied with what, where I am, which is a lot about what you talk about. But also, I do have goals. I do have dreams. I do have ambitions. I do have other things that I want to accomplish. And where do you find that balance? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think if anyone had the perfect answer, um, we'd all have found it. And that person would be very, very rich. <laughs> yeah, sure. what, what, I, what I'll say about that is uh, this. On one hand, I think that humans can be very content with a lot less than we think, especially in the context of modern life, right? It's like people were, people have been happy throughout time and space. And for the vast majority of time, people didn't own a lot of things. Their conditions weren't 72 degrees all the time. They had lives that um, had a lot of physical effort in. They had all these things that were seemingly hard, but they managed to find happiness, um, perhaps not even despite it, but maybe because of that. Right. So I do think that there's a message in there that we do thrive when we have some amount of challenge in our life, um, not an overwhelming amount, but some. And then the other thing that I will say is that um, <clears throat> humans are a really fascinating creature and that we are just relentless explorers and pursuers. Right. We are the only species that has literally taken over the globe. We've gone down into the deepest parts of the ocean. We've gone to the highest mountains. We've gone into outer freaking space. So we are this creature that just goes and, and goes, what's over there? Because there might be greener ga grass over there. But what if there's greener grass over there? There's greener grass over there. Now, that's obviously got us to where we are now. But I think in the context of everyday life, it takes a little bit of perspective to realize when you're just moving to different lawns and they're all pretty much the same and it's making you miserable in the effort. Um and so I think a lot of it comes down to realizing that the things that we often want to pursue, whether it's like possessions, whether it's partners, whether it's a certain number in our bank account, it's like these sort of worldly things. I think that you see that we only need a certain amount of them to be happy. And once we go over that, we don't get much more happiness. And in fact, like continuing to trying to pursue them can probably be counterproductive. And once you have sort of your bare minimum, um, you probably have to shift your goals to something bigger, whether that's helping people, whether that's doing the next right thing, whether that's devoting yourself to, I don't know, spirituality, something greater than yourself. Um, I think that that's a message that sort of held, holds up in most religions and throughout time. But how do you know when your ambition is making you miserable or how, or is it just part of being a human, the human experience, right? We're, we're going to suffer, whether we're talking about cavemen who you know, didn't have fire or food for three or four days, that's suffering. Or whether it's us who maybe just went through a, a breakup or a, a job loss or financial hardship. How do you know when it's actually your ambition that's making it miserable or just the human experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. What are some ways I can tell you that um, I do feel like when you start to see symptoms, underlying symptoms, something like um, addiction, depression, anxiety, all those sorts of things. Like if you're pursuing and yet you're ultimately fulfilled, that to me seems like it's, you're probably doing the right thing. Um, but I tend to think that a lot of the behaviors that we fall into that are negative in the long term, those are usually a symptom of something gone awry. And that could be just too much ambition, right? Hmm. Yeah, I think we kind of inherently know too, right? I mean, I, I like what you said about addiction, you know, self-destructive behavior versus, hey, I'm having a bad day. Right. Like we're, we're all right. going to have bad days, but if you start slipping into self-destructive behavior habitually and it becomes a trend, then I think there's some things that we need to look at as the underlying issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I find, I think that most self-destructive behaviors, when they start, they give us a benefit or else we wouldn't do them. Of course. Right. So it's like you, let's take this, a stupid example of like, you're on your phone too much. It's like most people, when you look at the, the data, 90 some odd percent of phone pickups aren't because of an external cue. They're because the person um, got bored 
or they experience stress or something, right? So we find these behaviors that will relieve whatever our problem is in the short term. But when we continue doing them over and over and over, they lead to long-term problems. But you're still going to get that short-term benefit, right? If I'm stressed out or I'm bored and I look at my phone and fall into Instagram, it did relieve that problem in the short term. But then the long-term problem is I've just wasted half an hour. I've just spent my time doing something that I don't ultimately want to be doing with my life that could be used a lot more productively. Same with addiction, right? You you get home from work, you're stressed, you're pissed off, whatever. You have a drink and it's like, wow, that, that fixed the problem pretty pretty quickly. So you have another, oh, well, that's good too. And eventually repeating that cycle over time, you start to accumulate long-term problems. But the problem is, is that the behavior still fixes your problem in the short term. So you often have to do something hard, which is not do the behavior. You have to sit with whatever the underlying issue is and figure out, well, why am I doing this in the first place? And then you can start to, even though that's hard, you can start to get rid of those long-term problems. If that makes sense. It does. And I just think the problem, not the problem, the challenge is we're so impatient and to have to sit with our own uh, shortcomings or inadequacies or boredom. It's like, why do that? <laughs> I can just turn the TV on. I can just have a drink. I could just have right. a smoke. I could do what, whatever your thing is, right? You can just do that. If it's if it's like, hey, I need to get laid, just jump on an app. Like everything that we we want to give us short term gratification is literally at our fingertips. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that that so this book I wrote, Scarcity Brain, that is very much a big part of the message is that you know, in the past we didn't have all these different ways to quickly escape to, you know, we couldn't just buy stuff all the time. We couldn't spend time on in these online worlds. We didn't, we didn't have like alcohol everywhere or whatever it is. And now we just have so many different ways to escape that we often find something that sort of does it for us. And that can ultimately be destructive. So in the past, you'd often, I mean, take boredom, right? Boredom is this evolutionary discomfort that basically tells us whatever you're doing with your time, your time invested is worn thin. So if you think about people hunting and gathering, let's say we're hunting and we need food and we're going to, or else we're going to starve. If there's no animals coming through, boredom kicks on and basically just tells us go do something else. Mm. Now in the past, we would have gone and done something productive. We would have gone and picked potatoes. We would have picked berries. We would have done something to survive. Right. But now it's like, we don't actually need to be doing these acts that we need to do to survive. And when we feel boredom, we've got this easy, effortless escape from it. And it's all over, right? It's in the form of your cell phone. It's in the form of your TV. It's in the form of your computer. It's like all these different ways to escape. And so I think what really happens is that a lot of these um, sort of evolutionary tendencies we have in the human brain to um, acquire, to be stimulated, to gather more influence, to, you know, eat, whatever it might be, um, they sort of almost get co-opted in a world where there's food everywhere, there's Amazon prime. You can have something to your house in six hours and you don't even have to leave the couch where right. if you want to get laid, you don't even have to go down to the damn bar and put in the effort of like spinning a good game, spinning a good game. You can just like go on Tinder and like swipe, 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 swipe. swipe. Oh, here's someone. They're just like totally down to it. We're not, we're not even gonna talk. Right. Um, right. so it's just, we've got like this abundance of all these things that we're built to crave now. And, um, we don't necessarily have a governor on how we manage them, let's say. So I actually, I want to talk about the governor before I do. I, I'm always a little skeptical of the, of the argument of, you know, well, we used to, right? Uh, thousands of years ago, our ancestors used to do intermittent fasting is what I hear a lot. It's like, well, yeah, because, you know, like they didn't have food all the time like we do. And now we have to force ourselves or, you know, our ancestors didn't have gyms. It's like, well, yeah, they didn't have perfectly balanced symmetrical barbells to lift, but they were, you know, moving logs and picking up rocks and throwing things at objects and, and animals so they could eat. Is that the argument? Because I'm not really sure I'm willing to trade places with the Neanderthals. So it's, it's just an interesting right. argument to me. Well, to me, what it is, is it's the, it's fundamentally an evolutionary mis mismatch, right? Um, our ancestors didn't necessarily choose to do the, the things they did. And so the blessing of our time is that we do have an abundance of all these things. We don't have to go move for our food. Um, we don't have to fast if we want to, but we still have, we're still compelled to behave in a way similar that our ancestors would have, would have, which is, for example, if you found food in the past, it made sense to overeat it. Like for all, all of time, 
eat it all eat it and all. do nothing. And by the way, exercise, we invented that 150 years ago when we realized like, oh, these new jobs we have that are more or less kind of sedentary. Like, it seems like we're getting health problems because of that. So what are we going to do? Like, I don't know. Let's just like build a building where people can go move around and like pick stuff up and put it down and like run on a belt. Right. Let's exercise. That never made sense for all of time. And so I do think that, um, while we can't be a slave to the, to the past, because to your point, like, yeah, our ancestors didn't choose the fast. Like they would have eaten if they had food, they would have eaten it all the time. Right. Of course. Um, but I do think that it can inform and can help explain a lot of times when we find ourselves in trouble in the present, more or less. So how do you then turn on, you, you use the term governor. So how do you turn on that governor and realize, you know, I'm, I'm overeating or, uh, or, or I've grown complacent or, uh, I'm on social media too much. And I think these are all things that most men would acknowledge readily. And yet they have a hard time and myself included tempering some of that behavior. How do you turn on that governor so that you can be comfortable with what you have and not overindulge? Yeah. Um, I'll answer that this way. So as part of this scarcity brain book, um, I got, um, I live in Vegas and you live pretty close to Vegas. If you've ever come down here, it's like there's slot machines everywhere and people play them around the clock. It's like grocery stores, gas station, restaurants, bars, whatever. And that is a behavior that it really doesn't make much sense, right? Cause everyone knows the house is always going to win. And so I start to get really interested in why do people get obsessed with slot machines? Like, you know, you're going to lose eventually. So long story short is that, um, I end up going to this lab that is effectively a living, breathing, working casino, but it's used for, uh, research on gambling, on human behavior, on all these sorts of different things. And when I'm there, I end up talking to a guy who designs slot machines more or less. And he explains to me how slot machines work and they work off this three part uh, habit loop that I call the scarcity loop. And it's got opportunity, unpredictable rewards and quick repeatability. So with number one opportunity, you have an opportunity to get something of value that can enhance your life uh, and form a slot machine. It's obviously money. Number two, unpredictable rewards. You know that if you, if you keep doing the behavior, you'll get the thing of value eventually, but you don't know when, and you don't know how valuable it's going to be. So with the slot machine, any given game, you could lose your money. You could win a couple bucks. You could win like $2 million and it changes your mm -hmm. life. Right. And so that's exciting. And then number three, quick repeatability. You can repeat the behavior over and over and over quickly. So with slot machines, people play 16 games a minute on average. Now, <clears throat> the reason that this is important and why we're talking about slot machines is because it's not really about slot machines, right? It's the, uh, that three part system has been placed in all sorts of different technologies and institutions uh, today. So basically it's what makes social media work. It's what makes dating apps easy to hook people on. It's being put in the gig economy system. It's being put in um, a lot of financial apps like Robinhood that increase quick repeatability. It explains the rise of sports gambling. So it gets legalized and then we put it into cell phones easily and we allow people to make multiple bets and sometimes bets down to the second in a game, right? And on and on and on. And so that's a kind of long way of explaining that. I think a lot of these behaviors that we get hooked on and do repeatedly that eventually hurt us, they tend to often fall into that scarcity loop, which is, you know, you've got this like random rewards game that you fall into and there's nothing better at grabbing human attention and holding it than that. And this is even seen in all different animals. Like I talked to the psychologist and he, you can turn a pigeon basically into a degenerate gambler in about two minutes by giving them a game that has this system and works in rats. Right. It works in monkeys. It works in all different animals. And it probably tracks back to finding food in the past. So if you think about our ancestors gathering food, you go to one place, no food, the next place, no food, the next place, no food. You need that food once you're going to survive. So you keep repeating the behavior and repeating the behavior and then jackpot, you finally find it. And that saves your life. And that's so exciting, right? So it's almost like we're inherently attracted to this, um, this system. And I think that a lot of times today, since it's been co-opted in a lot of different ways, we're still attracted to it, but it's in these places that we don't necessarily want to be. 
right? It's still like the random rewards are still going to hook our brain, whether it's in actual gambling, whether it's in slot machines, whether it's in the fact that our grocery stores have a billion different choices of chips and like, oh, I'm going to try this one. This one could be good, right? <laughs> yeah. um, whatever it might be. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I do think it provides a sort of underlying framework of how um, we do have these ancient brains and we do have these habit systems that used to keep us alive in the past and how now when they're applied to these sort of modern environments, they don't always make sense. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting as you were saying this, I was even thinking I've got a really big hunt. One of my favorite hunts of the year. I even see this in hunting. So I'll go out with a group of buddies and we'll go sit in different tree stands that are on the property we hunt. And, you know, you have the opportunity, which is to kill an animal. That's why we're all there. Uh, you have the unpredictable reward because at any given point, you could either see a deer or not see a deer or see a big buck or not see a big buck or your buddy's like, Hey, I saw a massive buck over here, but you didn't see anything. So there's that unpredictability. Um, and then the quick repeatability, cause you can go out every day and sit for, you know, hours and hours and you'll see something and that'll keep you coming back and back and back golf's the same way. You know, you keep coming back and you hit one good enough shot every once in a while to keep you coming back to this damned game. Uh, right. and, and then what I see guys do in the hunting world is, uh, you know, maybe they'll sit over here on the West end of the property, but on the East end of the property, uh, on the cameras is this big buck. And so even though the buck's been coming over on the West end every single day, you, the next sit, you're going to go over there because the camera picked it up over there. And then he happens to be where mm -hmm. you were. And you just end up chasing this buck all over this property. You're all over the place, never finding him with the hopes that you'll get something in return for it. Dude, that, that, that's exactly it. And hunting is a great, hunting is like the ultimate example, right? There, so the, a lot of these, um, this loop, it appears naturally in nature in a lot of forms. So people who get really into birding, it's like, mm. you want to see some sort of bird, you know, you're going to see a bird at some point, but you don't know if it's going to be like the crow that you see every day, or it could be some super rare bird. Like, Oh my God, I can't believe we saw one of those. Right. Um, and you're just kind of looking and looking, looking it's, um, it's obviously in fishing right? You toss a line. You don't know, um, if you're going to get a bite. And when the fish is on the line, you're like, well, this is tugging pretty hard. Like, is it a giant or is it just kind of small and strong, right? You don't know. And there's something inherently attractive about that to humans. And so I think one message that I talk about in the book is like, we know that this scarcity loop behavior will really grab our attention and hold it. And so the question is, how are you going to use it? Because I would argue that when you are falling into a behavior like hunting and being hooked by that, like you're outside, you probably had to hike in to get there. Um, you're doing it with buddies. Like you're getting all these things that are really good for you in the process of this behavior mm -hmm. that is kind of mm -hmm. almost addicting, right? Uh, whereas something like slot machine gambling, it's like you're sitting in a smoky casino. You're probably ripping a Marlboro Red. You're probably not hanging out with anyone. And it's all inside and you're not moving around. And so, and by the way, you're losing a lot of money in the process. Although one could argue hunting might be more expensive once you add up all the shit you have to buy, but <laughs> if you you're get the point I'm trying it, to make, right? I think it's fine if you're aware of it. Like if you actually know how much you're spending and you're, you, you think to yourself consciously, yeah, I'm spending a lot of money. Okay. That's different than yeah. I'm going to go do this for, you know, 12 hours, uh, and, and you're not even aware of the amount of money that's burning through your pocket. That's a different story. Right. Right. And so, yeah, one thing I actually, I actually say in the book is that like, I don't care if you want to spend 12 hours on TikTok. I just want you to make the conscious choice to spend 12 hours on TikTok because mm -hmm. unfortunately we tend to naturally just sort of zone out when we're in this system. Um, it's sort of like the ultimate fun escape. And I do think you see a lot of people, I mean, I see it in Vegas. It's like, someone will look up and be like, wow, I've been on the slot machine for three hours and how much have I spent? But also I would argue that probably everyone li listening to this podcast has been on some sort of app on their phone and been like, oh my God, I, I was on Instagram for 45 minutes just now. Or I, right. I've, I've been scrolling through the New York Times or the whatever it is, Fox News for 40 minutes down this rabbit hole of a story and I don't even realize it. So I think really, I'm just trying to get people to be aware of this thing, why they do it and where it lives. Are there general parameters that you would suggest people set up in their life? So for example, you know, you said awareness is key, but let's take social media. Is it just a matter of saying, Hey, I'm going to spend from 9am to 930 on social media. And then when 930 hits, I'm done, I'm done for the day or I'm done for the morning or, you know, whatever your own parameter is, is that the tactic or is there something else? 
Yeah, I think I think that's one of the tactics. Really, the way that you can reduce a behavior is to take away or change any one of the three parts that it has. So you can take away or change the opportunity. You can take away or change the unpredictable rewards. You can take away or change the quick repeatability. So your example is kind of taking away the quick repeatability, right? Because you're, you've are you only got a certain time limit. Um, another example that takes away quick repeatability would be um, there's certain apps where you have to, when you go to open the app that you find yourself going into too much, it makes you pause for like five seconds. And oftentimes that is enough for people to go, oh, wait, I didn't even really want to be in this app. I just like reflexively checked it. And so you tend to see time go down. It's an app that, that, that builds that function into it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Which when I oh, first heard it. of this, I was like, so you're telling me that I have to download an app so I can use another <laughs> app less. And I rolled right. my eyes. Um, but finally, like the, the, the founder of this uh, company, the one I was using, I think is called clear space. He was like, dude, just try it. I'm like, okay, I'll try it. And it really is based on behavioral psychology. I mean, it's just, uh, you download this app and then you pick the apps that you want to have to wait to get into. So then when you go to clip, whatever the app is that you spend too much time in, could be email, could be Twitter, could be anything. You're going to go, okay. Like it's, it says, do you want to use this app right now? And you go, yes. And they go, okay. You know, three seconds, three seconds goes by. And then it goes, how much time do you want to spend in the app? You got to pick, okay, I want to spend 10 minutes or I want to spend oh, yeah, five I wouldn't minutes. do that. I'm not, you, I'm, but, I'm not doing that app. <laughs> but if you find yourself stuck, like just spending way too much time on an app, I guarantee you that'll reduce your time because it no, just that's what takes I'm saying. away quick I would not do whatever app it's blocking me from. I'm like, I'm out because we want yeah. everything immediately. If I can't get on Instagram yeah, yeah, yeah. when I pull it up, I'll pull up a website and it'll take, you know, seven tenths of a second. I'm like, damn it. What's taking so long? And, and yeah, I, and I catch myself. Get, exactly. I get, I get so frustrated. It's like, uh, Oh, what's the comedian? Um, Louis CK or CK Lewis. I don't know what his name is, but he, he, t he has this like this uh, comedy routine. I think he did it on one of the late night shows and he's like, give it a second. It's going to space, you know, cause somebody was so upset. It wasn't <laughs> downloading whatever they wanted to immediately. We live in crazy yeah, times. Dude. That is how it is. Um, yeah. But and then another one would be, you could take away the unpredictable rewards. And this is a fun one on uh, phones. If you, turn your phone into grayscale mode where everything on the mm. screen is displayed in um, white, black, gray. That makes the phone less stimulating because colors stimulate us. They tell us to do things. So you think you see a red sign on the road, it tells you to stop, right? Um, they stimulate behavior. And so when you take a phone into the grayscale mode, you tend to see screen time go down significantly because the phone has just become far less rewarding, like far less rewarding. It's almost like, oh my God, this thing is so boring now. Yeah. I imagine the same is true for music. You know, you look at Instagram reels and, and stories and, you know, you can dub the music over the top of it and it makes a clip that was otherwise boring, pretty interesting. And these things tend to go viral. It's like you take the music yeah, out, you're like, mm, that's not nearly as exciting as I thought it was. Yeah, totally. And why, I mean, so, you know, you really see this um, almost arms race to figure out who can get the most attention grabbing thing. And that's just been climbing and climbing and climbing, especially since the 1800s when we started using the ad model in media. So the first guy who really used the ad model uh, to make money off a newspaper, he basically realized his name is Benjamin Day. He basically realized, <clears throat> okay, if I'm going to make money on advertising, I need the biggest audience I can get. Sure. Right? And then I'm going to take those eyes and I'm going to sell them to an advertiser. But I can charge more the more people I have. So how do I get as many people to read this newspaper? He goes, oh, I should make it as not boring as possible. I should start covering crazy stuff that will naturally grab human attention. So he starts all this stuff, murder, like scandals, all this crazy stuff in New York, uh, which was different than other newspapers were covering at the time. And in about a year, he had the biggest paper in the world. And then well, it's just been an paper? arms race. Ever it was called uh, The Sun. The sun. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I was thinking maybe it turned into like national Enquirer or something like that. <laughs> well, they, they are very good at it. Yeah. That would be, that's the model right there. But now we have it in a world where we have, where you can track every swipe, every pause, everything on an algorithm. Right. And then it kind of just gets floated up into you. So I think we're, yeah. we're starting to see like just this uh, sharpening of the needle there. Well, it's interesting. I have this consultant, this business consultant. He's like, Hey, I need your demographic data. I'm like, all right. Like, what do you need? So he told me and I'm like, okay. And he's like, this way you can come up with better 
product services offerings, which all makes sense to me. And, and I can see the value in that. He's like, and then you'll get a very clear picture on who your target customer is, who your ideal audience member is. And then you can speak to them directly. And I'm a, I'm a small fish, right? But when you think about these huge, huge corporations and conglomerates, the amount of money they're pouring in to know their customer, it's the same thing when you pull up your phone and you've been talking about going on a trip to Hawaii and all of a sudden you're getting bombarded with different ads from these incredible resorts in Hawaii. It's like, how did this know? I don't know. I don't understand. I mean, part of that is my, my, your phone might actually be listening to you, but the other part is it's just behavior, you know, what, what you're doing, what you're looking at, what you're, yeah. what you're engaged in and, and the computer is tracking it. Totally. And I mean, it's one of those where, you know, the example I like to give is when I go on Instagram, I, it just knows what I watch. It knows who I follow and I get fed so many things, uh, like, especially around the band, the grateful dead, who's like my favorite. And if there's like a, <laughs> if someone puts up like a bootleg tape, like I'm in for watching the whole, like five minute, you know, clip or whatever. <laughs> then the next one is like, Hey, you need this grateful dead sweatshirt from this like show from, you know, 1980, whatever. I'm like, Oh man, this yeah. sweatshirt's pretty sick. Right. But like no one else in the world is getting the same ad algorithms as I am, you know, for you, it might be like, you're watching a minute long hunting video. And the next thing is like, yo, check out this sick this new, new bow or you know? something. Yeah, yeah dude. <laughs> so, so yeah, true. it's one of those where, where it's like, this product was tailor-made in a lab exactly for my strange personality. And I do like it at the same time. I'm totally creeped out by this whole thing. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty convenient. I, uh, I bought these, these pants and I'm like, these are good. I like these. I like the fit of these. And all of a sudden I'm getting ads for the same pants that I bought. I don't even know how they got it. And I actually just got them in the mail about 15 minutes before I jumped on this call because I bought the same pants in two new colors, you know, and they just oh, yeah. they extracted $300 from me uh, because I bought, you know, two that I actually really liked. I don't even know how they did it, but it happened. <laughs> yeah, it happened. And so, you know, one, one portion of the book that I look at, um, cause I'm really kind of looking at, okay, what are the things that humans have sort of evolved to crave and, and need? And it's food, stuff, information, um, status, uh, et cetera. Belonging, maybe and, something like that. Sure. And, um, in the stuff section, I, I mean, it was just so fascinating because you look at how much people owned even 150 years ago and, you know, the average person might've owned three outfits and now the average person owns more than a hundred different outfits. Uh, the average home has more than 10,000 items in it. And really? this is not, yeah, this is not just, a, you know, this, this researcher who was looking at all the, this data, he talked about how a lot of people, you know, shop compulsively because it's so much easier now. And this is not just a problem for people who have money, like stuff has become so cheap that this has become an issue. This overbuying has become an issue for all economic classes, like for the first time ever, basically. Are you a, uh, are you a proponent then of this minimalistic mindset or movement that we see that I think tends to be, you know, growing in popularity? Uh, so I, I take the framework of, uh, that I find useful is what I call gear, not stuff. So when you look at why people buy things, uh, there's a lot of different reasons. It could be that, um, the thing is a piece of gear that helps you accomplish some larger purpose. It could be that you're getting status from the purchase, right? You know, a Rolex isn't telling you what time it is. It's telling no. you what time it is, but that's not why you buy Rolex. That's secondary um, but, to what the real, the real purchase meant to you. Sure. Exactly. Uh, third, people will buy things to belong. So this is like you're buying some sort of item to kind of be in a specific group that you want to be a part of. And then fourth, I think that people do a lot of buying just because they're bored and it's like, you got your phone and an ad comes up, which I'm guilty of that. Look at, I got, I got freaking five Grateful Dead t-shirts in my closet right now. <laughs> um, but I try and take the framework of gear, not stuff where every time I'm going to purchase something, I'm like, what, am, what is the higher purpose of this? What, am, what is this allowing me to accomplish? And so I think that that framework has just taken out a lot of the purchases I perhaps would have made in the past that wouldn't have really, that were just, to make a purchase or to like buy into some idea about, you know, status or belonging or something like that. So I've, I've found that useful. Do you find that alternative, maybe more noble or righteous? I don't even know if that's, a, if that's the right framing, um, more valuable, maybe more valuable, uh, goals and desires are a good deterrent. So for example, that might be 
uh, uh, maybe you want to buy a house and you need to come up with a $40,000 down payment. Mm -hmm. it, it is, does that tend to be sufficient enough to say, Hey, I'm not going to go out and buy the grateful dead shirt that I wanted to buy today, or, um, I'm not going to eat out this much this week because I'd like to save that extra hundred or $200 that I normally spend. Like, is that, is that a tactic that people use? Cause I tend to look at it and think, yeah, I might want to come up with that forty or fifty thousand dollar deposit on the house, but you know, me me going to McDonald's and spending eight dollars, yeah, that's that's okay. I can do that. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I think some people can be very stringent, but I think for most people, um, stuff is relatively cheap in the grand scheme of things. Um, here's a fun example: people used to burn down buildings in the 1800s just for the nails because nails mm -hmm. were so hard to find and so time consuming to make and so expensive. You literally had people like, well, I need some nails. I'm going to go set my neighbor's house on fire so I can get these nails. Now we can make like 400 nails in a single minute off of machines. Right. And they're right. so cheap. Like you go to home Depot and you buy a box of nails for like a buck, two bucks, something. Um, Four bucks with inflation, but okay. You point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I do think that things have become so cheap in a lot of ways, which is good because more people can get what they need, but they've also become so cheap that we all have so much stuff that we don't necessarily need. And that, um, I think that that can just become a hobby in and of itself. It's just buying shit. Yeah. I've noticed for myself personally, and I don't know if this is a mentality or if this is just human nature that when things get cluttered in my life, it's probably not human nature. It's probably more of a personality because I know people who love clutter to the extreme. You see all sorts of hoarder shows on TV and they just hoard everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, but I tend to look at when, when I have too much stuff in my life, whether that's activities or physical possessions that are just like consuming me, I can't, I can't focus on anything else. Like I would not be able to have this conversation with you as effectively if I had a thousand different things going on in this room that didn't belong there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. And there is actually research that suggests that people who have a ton of clutter in their office, um, it impacts their thinking, it impacts their uh, productivity. For me, I've definitely found that I do better work if I have fewer things to do. So it may not be as much of a stuff thing for me, but it definitely is a when the to do list gets too packed. Even if I stack all the crap I have to do later in the day and devote you know, four hours every morning to writing or whatever it is, that'll still impact my writing. Cause I have all these things that I know are coming up and on my brain. And I find that when I'm able to chop out some of the, the extras, I just have more time to have to think clear, to sort of deal with some of the ideas I have to grapple with as a writer. And, um, I do think it leads to better work. And I do think the trajectory over the last whatever amount of years is that we have a lot of opportunity to pack our schedule. I mean, I think that life was, uh, you know, they, it's a cliche to be like, times were simpler back then. But I do think you had less inputs coming into your way in the form of people trying to communicate with you, the things that you could possibly do for a job, um, the tasks you could be doing, all that sort of different things. I think it was a little more straightforward. Have you found any, uh, any, any advice for activities that don't, uh, that don't produce immediate results. So for example, when you write the scarcity brain, do you mind if I ask how long that took you roughly to write from start to finish minus the edits yeah, was, and all the, all the stuff, you know, just, just to write it itself. I would say probably two years to write it. And then there was, you know, the, the year of edits and public, all the publishing nonsense that goes along with getting a book out there. So, so with, with a th three year project essentially is what you're saying. It's like, man, how do you find the motivation to get up and write a thousand words today when you know that's just a drop in the bucket for what needs to happen? And also you've got plenty of time to make it happen. Right. You have to, you have to actually like the process and enjoy it. Um, I find that some of my happiest times uh, are when it's, you know, five in the morning and I'm working on a book grappling with a specific idea and trying to figure out how do I make this, how do I write this in a way that's entertaining and di digestible? I'll also say some of my most insane moments are at 5 a.m. when I'm writing and trying to make an idea digestible. <laughs> but it's kind of insane, learning. How do to, you mean? Well, it's hard, right? Mm. I mean, sometimes you're dealing with information that doesn't make sense and trying to be like, how do I explain this in a way that doesn't just put a person to sleep and feel like a textbook? Um 
maybe things haven't quite lined up. You're like, you're circling the drain of, I know I can make this idea make sense, but I'm not sh quite sure how the threads need to be tied yet, right? This is like tying a ship to a dock. And if I don't use this damn knot, the thing is going to drift off and go away. And like, what is the knot? I got to learn what this knot is in the first place. Then I got to learn how to tie it. Like, that's really hard. Um, but ultimately that's, that's very rewarding. And I think you can apply that um, across the board that if you don't, it, it, you have to enjoy what you are working on. That doesn't mean it's always going to be easy, but you have to find the outcome very rewarding, right? There's things that you and I could go do. Like we could go move rocks from point A to point B and it would be challenging, but like, what is the greater purpose? Would that ultimately like give us this large, deeper reward? And the answer is probably not. Right. And so I think you do have to find whatever that thing is for you. It could be building a business like for you. I'm sure you've got, um, you know, working on a podcast and building this thing into what it is. I'm sure that you've had a lot of setbacks, but you've also had a lot of times where you're like, oh my God, this is, this is great. Like I'm, I'm having the time of my life doing this and it's work. Yeah, it is work. And every once in a while I get a piece of feedback or an email from somebody who changed their life around. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, this, this is good. That's it. I don't, I've written a couple of books myself, not nearly to the same success that you've had. I hate the process. Like it, I find it miserable. Um, there, there's nothing about it that is redeeming for me other than being done with the book and knowing that somebody's going to take it and read it. And hopefully their life is going to be a little bit better because of it. And that that's enough for me to, you know, get me to write a thousand or 1500 words today. Mm -hmm. So you're, I mean, you're gratifying it sounds like is on a longer um, delay scale than mine. So I might, it might be 5am and I wade through some muck for an hour. And then the sentence comes together. And I'm just like, that's it. And that's my gratification. But for you, you wade through the muck for a year, two years, and then you get that email. And then you that's your that's it, right? But there is still some sort of gratification there. I think there's also gratification in the process, not so much about well, let me think about this for a second. So with writing the gratification, the process is I did what I said I was going to do. You know, if I, cause I, w when I was writing my books, I, I, I wrote, my goal is to write 1000 words per day. And regardless, I don't, I don't care how I feel. I don't care about the weather. I don't care about what else I have going on. I don't care about any of that. You write a thousand words per day because that's what you committed to doing. And some of those words were really good. And some of them were not so good. And some of them got edited and some of them got changed, but my goal was a thousand. And the, the, I did find joy in the sense of accomplishment that came from writing that 1000th word of, of the morning or the afternoon of the, of the day. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, for me, it's, um, I don't have a word limit per day. I mean, some days I'll just get on a heater and it might be a couple thousand. Some days it might be 200 words because I'm trying mm. to figure out, you know, how do I explain it? I might be dealing, I might have to read a certain study, make sure I understand it and then put it into English and that could take four or five hours, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, ultimately I do, I do find it rewarding. So, well, you've, you've hit the New York times. I haven't. So maybe I ought to be taking advice from you, not thinking about my, my own way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I start a podcast, I'll probably be like you with writing and be like, this is hard. And I'll have to right, we'll, hit you we'll, up for advice. Yeah. We'll trade industry secrets. Um, one of the chapters you talk about in the book is the, the concept of influence. I'm really interested in that because um, I, I do want to be influential uh, specifically and mainly influential in the lives of my children. Like if I had to select a group of people I want to be most influential with, it's them. Uh, but also I do want to be influential with my guests, guys like you. I want to be influential with, the guys who get involved with our movement and buy our products and services and offerings and come to our events. So I'm really curious your take on influence and is it a worthy ambition? When does it become too much? That sort of thing. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the reason that people want to be influential is um, it's always kind of given us a boost in life. You know, in the past, if you were a person who was more influential in your tribe, that probably got you out of crappy menial labor. It probably got you the the bigger cut of meat. It probably got you, you know, a couple more partners to procreate with that sort of thing. So I think that we did evolve to sort of crave uh, influence and status, and you still see that today. So when you look at uh, research on 
health outcomes, a big predictor of health outcomes is um, a person's status. And this holds even in countries where they have universal medicine. So people who are wealthier, who are generally living the higher status part of a uh, neighborhood or whatever, even though they're seeing the same doctors, they have better outcomes than the people who are lower status. So it definitely affects us because we're social creatures. And so for me, though, I think that um, one thing that's interesting about today is, you know, in the past, it might have been that you could only influence, say, 100, 100 people, 150 people, whatever your um, group was. And now it's sort of in this uh, realm where you could influence millions of people in a single in a single tweet, right? And it's all quantified. It's all gamified. You know exactly what your influence is if you're buying into, say, you know, I'm, I'm measuring this with the number of followers I have or the number of uh, people who liked my tweet or whatever it might be. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I do think that we need to be a little bit careful about how we use it. So I think it, I think that craving status can be good to a point, but eventually um, it backfires because it's kind of a moving target, right? Once you get the, once you get that much status, you want a little more, you want a little more, and that can lead us into things that are not always good. So there's a, a researcher I talked to whose name is Jessica Tracy, who uh, she researches pride. And she talks about how there's really two types of pride. There's what she calls authentic pride, which is when we do something that is uh, good and we feel this sort of great feelings of pride, right? And it doesn't matter if someone saw us do that or not. Like it's this it's useful contribution earned, we made. Right? Something earned, great way to Got put it. it, yep. And then the other is inauthentic, which is essentially unearned. That's when we can advertise ourselves when we're trying to sort of front that we're someone we're not and better than we actually are or have accomplished something great when we haven't. And I think that uh, today it's easier to for people to sort of blast out that inauthentic pride, that sort of unearned, because you can put whatever you want on social media. And in a lot of ways, we all advertise our life on social media if we use it, right? We're usually not taking the photo of ourselves where we look like absolute shit and we're out like, you know, <laughs> picking up the dog crap in the backyard. It's uh, so it's a, it's a strange world. And I think we're, we're all having to kind of navigate. What does that really mean? I look, I'm going to say something controversial, but I think about this when it comes to the LGBTQ, whatever agenda, it's like, if you were born that way, which is the argument, then what are you proud about? That's not, that's nothing mm. you did. That's nothing you chose. So like, why the excessive pride? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily take pride in being a straight a straight man because like this is how I was born. Like this, this is nothing I earned. So it's interesting when we see, and I'm using that as an example, but it is interesting when we boost ourselves up and prop ourselves up on something that we didn't actually go out and do like run a marathon uh, or lose 100 pounds or, you know, bring happiness to a bunch of people uh, or donate to an organization or charity, which I think is, is significantly greater than, Hey, here's what I look like, or here's how I am. And I'm just proud of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see your argument. I mean, I think probably when you see that sort of um, advertising of oneself, it's often a reaction to uh, having felt suppressed for that for a period of time. So, you know, from, from their perspective, they might be like, well, this is something I could never talk about. And I never could even be proud of if I wanted to, because society suppressed that part of me for so long. And that, so I've been constrained. Now I'm having the equal opposite reaction of unleashing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. A, a reaction or a response to not being able to be so open about some of those things in, in the past or other people who have not been able to do those things. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, and then that opens up, uh, you know, larger, I think, debates and questions about at what point does it become an overreaction? What is the appropriate reaction to that? Do we overcorrect? And then once we overcorrect, how do we correct back? And I do think that, um, to quote uh, Martin Luther King, it's like this long bend towards finding what um, what the right answer is for these types of things. You know, I had a really in interesting interaction in a, in a convenience store not too long ago. Um, there was a woman working there and she had like, her hair was interesting. It looked nice. It was interesting. I said, I really like your hair. And she said, thanks. I grew up myself. And uh, you know, she was just being funny. And, and I thought that's a really good answer. Like there isn't anything special. Like it just grew, you know, like she, she was funny. She liked the way it was, but she wasn't overly boisterous or proud about it because it's just the natural state of things. Like it wasn't a big deal. And I'm like, you know, I really appreciate that answer. <laughs> 
That's awesome, dude. I love that. I'm going to remember <laughs> that one. That's killer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a cool person. I mean, yeah, really cool. And and I think those are the people that we appreciate most is that they have something unique or interesting or special or something that stands out about them, whether it's just who they are inherently or something they've worked on. Uh, but somebody who's not overly boisterous or proud about it, uh, they're just, they're just, they're just exercising humility and, and they're enjoyable to be around. Yeah. 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 Totally. I'm with you. Hmm. How do you, uh, so in the book itself, you talk about fixing this craving mindset. Are there some strategies that you would suggest that we do or in, in implement on a, on a daily basis, or is it just being aware of it that, that we can do in order to not be so desirous of things that we don't really need to desire or crave after? Yeah. Um, I think awareness helps. I think, um, what I mentioned before finding if you can, uh, change or get rid of any of those three parts of the the loop. Mm. And then I think the third thing that I found to be really interesting when I was reporting this book is that, um, so I mentioned how that guy can make these uh, pigeons, basically turn them into these degenerate gambler pigeons, right? With this, They'll choose this gambling game over a game that actually gets them more food over time. Um, but what this guy found is, so normally these pigeons, they live in these small cages, right? And they think they're fine, whatever. Uh, but when they put these pigeons in an environment that was more like their kind of natural environment where they had to work, they had to build nests, they had they could live like a no pigeon normally would, they could interact with other pigeons. Then they put them back in the in the game where they can choose, are you going to play the optimal game or are you going to play the basically pigeon slot machine game? And what they found is that all the pigeons started playing the game that actually got them um, more food that was the more rational game. So they didn't want to distract themselves with this sort of, scarcity loop gambling game and the guy who did all this research and who i was talking to he then kind of made the comparison to humans he just went right away and was like you know and i think that you, you see this in humans as well it's like when we are living a life that isn't kind of a, a good fit for us when we're not doing things that challenge us when we're not having to work to survive when we're not doing these things that we almost kind of would have done forever um we start to look for stimulation in other ways we might drink, we might gamble, we might, um, you know, get super obsessive about work. We might like, there's all these different things we can do to distract ourselves. And so for me, my takeaway was, um, you kind of have to find some higher purpose that, you know, is going to be rewarding and lean into that. And oftentimes when you're doing those sort of behaviors that can be counterproductive in the long term, that's usually a signal that there might be something underlying. You might be in the cage, you might be in a small cage and you need to figure out, well, where the hell is my big cage? And how do I get into that? How do, how do you develop that though? Because I mean, I don't think that's new information necessarily, you know, especially in the self-help space and world, people say, Oh, you find your calling, discover your purpose. That, that isn't new information, but I still find so many men who have a hard time uncovering it, even myself. Now I've found it. Uh, and I feel fortunate and blessed. I've worked really, really hard to, explore a lot of different veins and move towards things that I didn't really feel like may turn out, but I had some level of interest in and they developed into essentially what you see now. And I feel very fortunate, but a lot of guys just haven't, haven't been able to achieve that and find that to be pretty elusive. Yeah. I think you got to try stuff. I think you got to try different stuff. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do, even if you're not going to quit your job and do something crazy. I mean, I do think that we know that, um, doing things in nature, for example, tends to be rewarding to humans, especially if there's a level of challenge to that. I think it's finding ways to get out of yourself, which that could be some sort of volunteering you do, some sort of side project that really gives you um, rewards. And I think it ultimately is a search. I mean, that's the whole, it's the whole backbone of religion, right? So it's a search. We're searching for some answer to these like things that we have about being a human, which is that we, we often aren't satisfied. And, but I do think that the search is worth going on and trying to trying different things and seeing what works for you. Because if, if it is just, well, I don't know what it is and I'm not going to do anything about it. Well, you're, you're going to be stuck either way. And you've only got, you know, as far as I know, one shot at life. It's like, try stuff, see what, see what works, see what doesn't work. The whole point is the search. That is interesting because I think there's so many things in life and some of them are noble and some of them aren't. 
that are designed to keep us from searching. I think about, for example, something that might be noble as a marriage, uh, where you as a man might feel the desire to go out and be ambitious or start something new or start a business. And your wife might be more interested in the status quo. And I'm not even saying that negatively. She's very consumed with safety and security and stability. And you going out to start a business does not represent any of those things, right? So she may not be interested in you, quote unquote, searching. Um, I, I think there's other powers that, that be, maybe it's even the government to a degree, who's not interested in, in a man, a strong, independent, resilient man going out and searching and finding his own way and becoming sovereign in a lot of ways because he's unpredictable and he's harder to control. So there is mm -hmm. a lot at work against us, both noble and, and not so noble. Uh, that keep us from going out there and, and searching and, and trying to find a path for ourselves. Yeah, I think so. And I think that as you see, a lot of this is determined um, by technology. So basically, the more technology you insert into life, the more you have to abide by some sort of system because you start to need rules. I mean, just think of something as simple as the car. It's like once we invent the car, it's like, okay, well, now we have all these people just driving around. We can't have that. So we got to have roads and then we got to have like this law. Then we got to have that law. Then we got to, okay, well now you got to pay to park it. Now you got to do all these different things as a result of this single technology. And I do think that the more tech that we have in our life, the more constrained we can often be, which is just kind of part of living in this system. But I do think it's a noble fight to try and find the things that are going to allow you to, um, feel like you're doing the thing that you want to be doing. Like you've got some real purpose and oomph behind your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think when you find that, um, things begin to unfold in a different way than they did before, you know, and, and I don't think things necessarily become easier, but the path becomes clearer, which gives you the mindset and the fortitude to be able to continue on in the face of challenges and adversities. You know, I've had my own share, fair share of challenges and adversities over the past year and a half, but I'm plowing through them because I realize the importance of being a good father. Uh, I realize the importance of the work that we're doing here. And so I'm not free of hardship. I just can see past it and plow through it. Yeah, totally. And you know, the hardship is going to give you perspective too, that um, enhances your life probably in the long term. You know, I don't think people learn from times when they have no problems. <laughs> There's no impetus to change. There's no, you know, whatever. It's always, you look at all the ancient myths. It's always, you know, the, the main character, things are great in their life until they're not. And then when they're not, they go on this journey of, that is ultimately uh, an inner journey of self-discovery and learning new tools that allow them to go back into normal life and be a better human uh, that enhances themselves, uh, their future and the community around them as well. Excellent. Well, Michael, I appreciate this conversation, man. Um, I love your work. I love the book, the scarcity brain comfort crisis is your previous book, read that book, of course, had you on to talk about that as well. Um, why don't you let the guys know where to connect with you? And then, uh, is there any way you could give us a sneak peek into what might be coming down the pike? Like I'm sure, cause you talked about this being a three-year project if I do my math correctly, you're writing this book even before the comfort crisis came out. So I'm curious about what might be next. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the, the publisher is asking me when's the third book and I haven't, uh, I've been thinking about it, but a lot of what I spend my time on now is I have a sub stack that it's, uh, it's called 2% and it's at twopct.com. And it covers a lot of what I write about in my books, but, um, it comes out three times a week. So that, you know, the upside of books is that um, you kind of have this one tome where everything is, but I do think that it's really fun for me to write in sort of present tense and have more back and forth with the people with common interests. So writing three times a week uh, via Substack has been an awesome way to do that. And it kind of allows me to write in the present tense and get thoughts out while I have them and while they're relevant. And so that's been a, that's been a fun project for sure. Awesome. Awesome. We'll send guys over there. Michael, I appreciate you again and your work. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it.